these new layout technologies that we have are changing our medium. It's going to allow us to do things that weren't possible before. And personally, I feel like in a way, it's making the web become what the web has always meant to be and what 50 years from now people will understand the web to be, but what it kind of wasn't quite in the first couple decades. One of the things that we know now, post the switch to responsive web design, is that we don't have control over how wide a web page is. Web pages could be, or web viewers, web browsers, the web browser, the viewport could be any width. We don't really know what it is. It's also true that it could be any height and any aspect ratio. Your website on one person's computer, one person's device might be seen like this, and on another person's might be seen like this. So there's this landscape out, way in which it could be, there's a portrait way it, it could be. And we, as people who make the website, design the website, code the website, do not control any of that. Before responsive web design, we really thought about the top edge a lot and we thought about the left edge a lot. We sort of assumed how wide the web page was. For a while, we assumed that it was going to be 800 pixels. Then we assumed that it was going to be 1024 wide. We also had a lot of, we kind of pretended where the bottom would be, that it would be 600 pixels or it's 768. Uh, responsive web design woke us up to the fact that we don't know how wide the page is, right? So now, these days, we think a lot about the top and both the left and right edge. And we ignore the bottom. Although, lots of times we're in meetings where people say, I would like this thing, my content, this headline, this new slideshow, this must be above the fold. And a lot of us, a lot of web designers say, there is no fold, there is no fold. Stop saying we need it to be above the fold. We have no idea where the fold is. It's true, web pages don't fold. That phrase comes over from newspapers where with a home page, a front page of a newspaper, of a paper newspaper, editors would decide what would go above the fold, what would go below the fold, because the things above the fold would appear on the newsstand, the newspaper sitting on the newsstand, you could see the things above the fold. You didn't see the things below the fold, right? So that's where that idea comes from. The reality is, though, with the new CSS that we have, we do have quite a few tools that are going to let us pay attention to that fourth edge. And they're going to let us design and create things that are flexible, fluid, responsive, whichever word you want to use, so that they they fit within the space that's available. I don't think that means we should have these discussions about what goes above the fold. Uh, I do think that it means as designers and as folks who make decisions, business decisions or content decisions, we should think about what is it that's inside the viewport when the page first loads. After people scroll, what is it that's inside the viewport? How could we think about that four-sided box and design things to fit inside the viewport as a whole image? If you have a data visualization, if you have a map, if you have some kind of graphic that you want to show people, maybe it's going to be halfway down the page on your article and you want to uh, size that so that when people get to it, it's small for small screens, it's big for big screens. That way it could be the maximum size possible, but not be sticking out, not, not have any overflow, have it be so that people can see everything all at once. It totally depends on the content. And of course, I've been talking about this, like content websites are the main kind of websites. These kinds of principles, I think, apply even more to something that you might call an app or an application where you have toolbars or you have buttons or you have things to be interacted with, you might want to make sure that a group of them are in frame together and make them smaller if there's less space or make them bigger if there's more space or change the layout based on the amount of space that's available. So how is it that we can really design to the viewport and we can design to all four sides of the box? Well, viewport units and CSS Grid give us a lot more to be able to control that. So I wanted to show you this one example. Um, if we come here to labs.gensimmons.com, I've got this uh, study on flexibility and how is it that we can make things vertically flexible as well as horizontally. Michael Pollan, I'm a big fan of his. I went to his website recently and I saw that in fact, it's not responsive at all. It's a fixed-width website. 
here's a kind of a recreation of that of the homepage he has now. He has a few more things on it than this, but this is a simplification of his homepage. And you can see that as the browser window gets smaller, it just is in the space, right? This is how we did things before responsive web design. If we come here to the second part of this example, this is how things work with responsive web design, um, with the idea of changing the layout at different breakpoints, with using some of the things that Ethan Markout was talking about. This example definitely changes in the horizontal direction. It gets smaller or bigger based on the amount of space that's available. But it does nothing in the vertical direction. There's no way in which it responds to that bottom edge of the box. So you might easily have a situation where, you know, on a phone or something, um, you know, this word here is sort of caught and it just kind of is what it is. This is what we're used to today. We don't really worry about how things look. We just assume that people are going to scroll. Um, and of course, this works great, but uh, for the sake of graphic design, there are times when we might really want to more carefully construct what is happening inside this box. So let's look again. If we go to uh, my idea of what we might be doing in 2018, you can see here that the entire layout responds to both the horizontal and vertical direction and it gets smaller so that if there's not very much space for things everything is going to fit into the space that is available. This house gets smaller. Why not? The house is just a sort of a, a image, a graphic detail. It's not the most important thing on the page. If there's lots of space for it, let's go ahead and see it. But if there's not, let's, let's you know, make it smaller so that we can see things. Maybe somebody's on a laptop that has a very small screen uh, in the vertical direction. They can get to the page and they can see the links and everything instead of having to scroll to see them. So how is it that I pulled this off? Well, really, this is possible because of CSS Grid. So let's look at the code. I'm in Firefox, so I have access to the Firefox Grid Inspector, and I'm in Nightly in July 2017, so I can go over here to this Layout panel, and I can turn on the header, and I can also jump, you know, maybe I'm like up here in the HTML, I can jump to this header element, which is where the display grid is, and I can see the grid, how it is that I've defined this grid. So this grid is one column wide. There's no need to have multiple columns. This is really all about using rows and using the power of grid to distribute space in the vertical direction. So I've got several rows here. This first row is 3FR. The second row is min-max 100 to 350 pixels. The third row is max content. The fourth row is auto and the fifth row is 1FR. So what the heck does that mean? Basically it means that this first row and this last row are being defined by FR units. And the first row is 3FR, the last row is 1FR. And basically that means, hey, there's other stuff in these middle three rows, but once those middle three rows have the space that they need, we want the browser to take the leftover space and can distribute it using FR units. So the first row is going to get three units and the last row is going to get one unit. Or you add three and one together, you get four. So the first row is going to get three quarters of the extra space and the last row is going to get one quarter of the extra space. This is especially true because these two rows are empty. If they had content in, it, in them, they might behave a little bit differently, but because they're empty, the browser is going to go ahead and get rid of the extra space. As we start to have less and less space in the vertical direction, the browser is going to take those two FR, the, the, the two rows that are defined by FR units, and it's going to shrink them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they're actually down to zero. As it does that, it's always going to give the top row three times as much space as the bottom row. And then the middle rows, so let's look at this. This where it says Michael Pollan. I've got an H1 here, and that H1 has some margins on it, a top and a bottom margin. That row is being defined by a max content height. Max content is a way in which saying, I would like you to be as large as you can possibly be, but no larger in order to fit the content that you have. So in this case, it's basically saying, uh, I want the height of this row to be the 
headline Michael Pollan plus the margins on that headline. The next row is this nav bar, and you can see on the nav bar itself, I've got, uh, you know, it seems to be, this nav bar seems to be taking up more space than it is, but if you dig in, you can see that, oh, on this unordered list inside the nav, I've got a margin bottom. If I remove that margin bottom, for instance, then that row is going to grow shorter. Or here I've got a list item, and it's got a little bit of a margin on it as well. If we were to set this to be zero, then it would be even, like the things would squish together. But the, So the content inside of the navigation, the nav element, has some sizing on it. Uh, and that's what's creating the space that this particular row needs. Um, but this is defined as, let's look, look back here on the header, we can see our grid template row definition. This row is being set to auto. So basically, it's just going to be the amount of space that it needs in order to hold the content that it has. It's going to automatically calculate itself. It's not going to be smaller than the content. It's not going to be bigger than the content. Um, and then this house, the row that is the house, let's look up here. Um, so this is min, max, 100 to 350, which basically is saying, I would like you to be a minimum of 100 pixels and a maximum of 350. So in this case, there's plenty of space at the moment, looking at this example, the way that it's set up right now. There's plenty of space. The extra space is being given to the FR units, but the house itself is allowed to be the maximum in this min-max definition. So that house is 350 pixels tall. Now, if I start to make less and less and less and less space, what you can see is that the FR units are getting are disappearing. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The house, the Michael Pollan headline, the navigation is staying the same. And we're going to get to the point where the FR units are down to completely zero. So there's no more space that can be taken away from the two rows that have the FR units. And now we start to squish the min-max, which I find absolutely fascinating that by combining FR units in a min-max definition, we end up with a kind of two-stage responsiveness where certain things squish while the other things stay the same. And then once they become zero, then the next tier of things start to squish. So in this case, the Michael Pollan headline stays the same height, the nav bar stays the same height, but the house starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it goes all the way down to its minimum of 100 pixels. If we keep going, basically the house will stop shrinking once it hits 100 pixels, and the Michael Pollan headline and the navigation is not going to shrink either, in which case the layout will start to get overflow, and that's where a vertical scroll will start to kick in. But otherwise, we can play around with this and just get all kinds of beautiful layouts. Here, let's remove the grid, let's close the inspector, let's close responsive design mode, and you can see again how it is that this responsive vertical layout, a really a flexible layout, a kind of truly flexible graphic design on the web will make this be kind of beautiful at every screen size, no matter how big the viewport is when a user hits the page.